Welcome everyone to the June 2021 Food Thinkers. Part of our 2020-21 Food Thinkers Women Redesigning Food Systems seminar series, which brings together big ideas from women in academia, policy, business and advocacy on redesigning food systems. And today I'm delighted that we'll be hearing from Professor Christina Hicks of Lancaster University in the UK on fishery contributions to food and nutrition security under a changing climate. My name is Professor Kiruna Hawkes. I'm director of the Centre for Food Policy, and I'll be hosting the seminar tonight, uh, part of our regular seminar series of the Centre for Food Policy and moderating the questions. Just to say um, a few words at first about uh, the um, uh, the series, um, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available online afterwards via our YouTube channel. Uh, we're going to have around 40, 45 minutes of talk from Christina. And um, as she's talking, please do start to write your questions into the Q&A, not the chat, but the Q&A, please, which I will moderate after Christina's talk. And we'll try and, of course, respond to all the questions uh, as we can in the time that we have available. Uh, this is called Food Thinkers for a reason. It is designed to stimulate reflection among those who have tuned in to listen uh, and, uh, and participate. Uh, if there is something though you want to show on social media, you're very welcome to do so using the hashtag Food Thinkers and our handle is at Food Policy City. If you'd like to receive our monthly newsletter and updates about these events, please sign up to our mailing list. Just start, type your name, name and email address in the chat function and send it to just the panelists as that way it will remain uh, private. We frequently get asked on these uh, webinars about our MSc in food policy uh, and uh, uh, Elaine will write, uh, will put a link to the Masters in Food Policy where applications are open in um, uh, into the chat so you're able uh, to view that and approach us for any questions at a later stage um, if needed. Uh, these are monthly seminars and we're looking forward to our next Food Thinkers on July the 15th with Shu Wenug of the University of North Carolina who'll be talking about pricing policies, uh, food taxes, subsidies and incentives to address food and nutrition issues and we'll be opening registrations for that uh, event tomorrow. So now on to the today's uh, today's talk. So as I said, delighted to welcome uh, Professor Christina Hicks in what is London Climate Week for the second in our collection of two talks uh, relevant to climate change. And Christina is an environmental social scientist who works on how social, ecological and institutional settings shape food, conservation and governance outcomes across aquatic and coastal systems. And I was trying to remember whether we've had a food thinkers about um, fish and aquatic systems before. And I, I think this is the first time ever. So it's a particular pleasure to welcome Christina this evening. Uh, Christina is a prestigious and key name in the field. Uh, she's coordinating lead author on the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Assessment on Sustainable Use of Wild Species, and on the UN Food Systems Summit and Stanford Blue Food Assessment Leadership Teams. She's a professor within the Political Ecology Group at Lancaster University's Environment Center and adjunct at James Cook University. Her work is global and her current field work focuses on East and West Africa. So uh, we're delighted to, to welcome you, Christina, and I, for one, I'm really looking forward to learning more um, about uh, fishery contributions to food and nutrition security under a changing climate. Over to you. Thank you very much, Karina, and thank you for having me here. Um, it, is, uh, it is great to be able to be talking in this seminar series. I've, I've listened to a number of your previous talks and I've always found them really, really stimulating. Um, and I'm particularly happy um, that fish and fisheries and aquatic foods are, are increasingly becoming part of, of, of food conversations. Um, I'd like today to talk a little bit about 
the work that I've been involved in. Um, so I'm going to talk about work that I've led, but also work that's been led by a number of my key close collaborators. So just to highlight a few people at the bottom there, Nick Graham, Ava Mayer, James Robinson, William Chung, Jessica, Zach, Pip and Aaron McNeil. And these are very close friends of mine, but they're also very close um, collaborators. And um, so I'll variously talk about their work. Hopefully for those of you who've not thought very much about fisheries or fish, I, I hope I'll be able to pique your interest um, a little bit. And particularly today and this week on climate, um, it, because of the theme um, on climate, I'd really like to impress how many of the challenges facing food and insecurity, food insecurity around the world, particularly in low income countries, are working in concert with climate change. So, so climate change forms this backdrop that increases the urgency and the pressure of all of the problems we're facing and experiencing. Um, and hopefully, I'd like to suggest that addressing some of the pressures that are acting on food and in food insecurity in the regions in which I work will actually go some way towards helping address and alleviate some of the key drivers behind climate change. Now, part of why I like fisheries is they are inherently a very multidisciplinary system. Um, many fishery scientists arrive in this space um, working in the ecosystem and I, I started initially working under the water trying to understand um, ecosystem processes and what were happening um, under water. I quite quickly moved to trying to study and understand fisheries once they were landed. Um, I spent a lot of time sitting on coastlines watching fishermen going out and watching them come back in, watching the dynamics in the communities and beginning to understand how people fished, why they fished in the ways they do, and the meanings associated um, with their livelihoods and fishing practices. Fisheries are incredibly diverse all over the world. Um, some of these pictures are from um, the Pacific um, uh, as well as Africa. Um, we often think of fisheries as large commercial or industrial, by, but by far, the largest majority of fishers in the world are what we call a small scale fishers. Um, and fisheries are distinct to aquaculture in that they are wild caught, um, so akin to hunting on land. Um, but often um, fishery statistics are reported together with aquaculture statistics. So at times I will talk about fisheries in which I mean wild caught fish, and sometimes I'll talk about fish, which will be including fisheries as well as aquaculture, which is farmed fish. So after spending a lot of time on these beautiful coastlines and looking, understanding the diversity of fishing practices, um, I've become increasingly interested in how fish is moved around the world. Um, so both out on the water, but also through markets and through trucks um, and through air because these global processes um, are really what act upon the local processes um, and shape what's possible to, to, to get and how to benefit from, from local food systems. So fisheries are, employ a larger number of people. They are widely traded. Seafood is the most traded food commodity globally, but they're also a really important form of food. Um, they are, often thought of as animal source foods because they're rich in key micronutrients like other animal source foods, including zinc, iron, um, but fish in addition have high levels of B12 and omega-3. In many low and middle income countries, fish is a really important source of food because it's often the only form of animal source food in an otherwise predominantly plant-based diet. So the contributions that small quantities of fish make are disproportionate to the quantities that are consumed if you compare it to the global consumption patterns when we think about seafood. So in total, fisheries and aquaculture produce approximately 200 million tons of fish 
Most of this is in Asia and 50% of this is wild caught. Fisheries and aquaculture employ 800 million people and over 90% of these are in Africa and Asia and 50% of them are women. Globally, they generate $141 billion um, in trade. And back to the food part, um, seafood or fish provides an estimated 3.2 billion people with approximately 20% of their animal protein. Um, but in many low-income countries and Pacific Island countries, this is up to 80% or even up to 90%. So just highlighting again, the disproportionate benefit that these, this form of food plays in these contexts. So fisheries are critical to food and nutrition security, and particularly in Africa and Asia, um, where they play a disproportionate role in terms of supporting livelihoods, but also in supporting diets. But as in everywhere around the world, um, and as I think everyone will have heard about the heat waves in, in, in America happening this week, and increasingly we're hearing more and more about these um, extreme climate events, fisheries are ex experiencing uh, the negative impacts of climate change. Now, William Chung has led some work with us trying to understand what are the likely impacts of climate change on fish, um, Fish, fish, fish production on the fish that's being caught or the fish that's available to be caught. The map that you can see on the left hand side, the colours of the countries that you can see in dark grey are places that are more dependent on fisheries. So fish makes up a greater proportion of animal protein in those countries. And the colours that you can see um, on the sea um, are telling you what's likely to happen by 2050 uh, to the nutrients that are available in fisheries that are being caught in fisheries. And so the red places are where we're expected to see up to 60% declines relative to 2000 in the nutrients that are available to be caught in these fisheries. And as you'll see, the places that are experiencing the greatest impacts from climate change, that will experience the greatest losses from climate change are these places across the tropics. So areas in West Africa, areas across the Pacific as well. And these are the places that are also dark blue on land because they're the places where people are most dependent on the fisheries currently. To just really drive home the inequities in projected changes between the nutrients that we're able to be catching out of the waters on the right hand side, what you can see is the projected changes in the calcium yields and the iron yields, um, just as two examples. Um, and the green line shows the extra tropical areas, whereas the purple line shows the tropical areas. So around about 2025, we're expected to experience these severe drop-offs in the availability of calcium and iron um, in the catches off countries in the coastal zone. Whereas the rest of the world is unlikely to really um, notice some of these changes. So it could conceivably be okay for some countries to not think about the implications of these changes in these nutrients. But countries in the tropics where food insecurity and nutritional insecurity is already most severe are the places that are gonna have, will be reckoning with the impacts of these changes. Some recent work um, led by Ava Mayer has asked how then, often we think about, when we think about fisheries, we talk about fisheries being vulnerable or threatened by overfishing, but also by climate change. Um, but Ava Mayer's led this work to try and understand how different countries around the world are likely to respond um, to fishing and also to climate change, um, given the characteristics of the different species that are currently being caught in the, in the, in the waters off of those countries. And what you can see, the shaded out, I've, we've just highlighted here the countries that have really nutrient dense catches. So the places where the catches are most beneficial to people's diets in terms of their nutrient concentrations. And what you can see, most of the nutrient dense catches or the countries with nutrient dense catches have a relatively low vulnerability to fishing. So this doesn't mean that you can just fish 
um, indiscriminately, but it suggests that there is more hope for fisheries management or to achieve sustainable fisheries management in these countries. But the impact of climate change is likely to hit these fisheries and these places most severe. And in fact, 40% uh, of countries um, are more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change um, than the impacts of fishing. Once again, really underscoring the importance or the significance of climate change um, on fisheries around the world, and particularly for nutrient dense fisheries. So it's unavoidable when working in the space of fisheries, and um, particularly fisheries and food security, to not recognize that global action on climate is really critical to fisheries, but also to food security. So acting on climate at a global scale really has to underscore everything that we do. And although I don't often focus on climate change, I can't avoid, I can't afford not to pay attention to the climate when I'm working on issues of fisheries and issues of food security. So I'd just like to take a minute to come back to this idea of fish as a nutritious source of food. Up until about 10 years ago, um, fish had been largely left out of the conversation um, on food security. But increasingly, over the past 10 years, people like Shakuntala Filstead, who won the um, World Food Prize um, this year, have really been trying to you know, raise the profile and the importance and the recognition of how valuable a source of food fish is. So fish are rich in these micronutrients, things like calcium, vitamin A, omega-3, vitamin D, iron, zinc, B12, things that our bodies need in tiny quantities. But if we don't get them, particularly in the early days of life, so the first thousand days, for example, they can lead to long-term physical um, and mental um, delays. So fisheries are really highlighted for these nutrient potential. Ty Beale has read, led some work recently really trying to understand the contribution that fish and other locally available foods make to people's diets. What he did or what they did is they identified what the key nutrient gaps were. And this, this graph here is from Southern, Southern and Eastern Africa. Um, and they identified six key nutrients that were commonly lacking in children's diets, including calcium, vitamin, iron, zinc, and vitamin B12 that are, that are, that are available in, in fish. And they looked at how much of a single serving or, or, or of how much would be needed to meet the dietary requirements for children under uh, two years, I think it was, um, of foods that were often, uh, uh, locally available. And in their work, they found that dried small fish came out as particularly nutritious um, in these nutrients that were locally lacking in diets. And the graph on the right hand side shows that actually it would only take six gram portion of small dried fish to meet a third of the dietary requirements. Um, subsequent work that they did found that actually small dried fish was also one of the most affordable sources of foods. Um, however, frozen fresh fish, while still nutritious and important, came far further down. But when it comes to fish, unlike terrestrial based um, animal source foods, we regularly catch and trade over 2000 species of fish. And we don't really, or up until recently, we haven't really had a good handle of what nutrients are found in, or we know what nutrients are found, but to what, what, what concentrations of these key nutrients are found in different species of fish. So which fish are particularly beneficial and which fish potentially are not. So in order to understand the potential they can play in plugging nutrient gaps. So we turned to the literature and also to FAO's InFood database, that's a food composition table um, that's been, been compiled um, for a number of years by, by the FAO to identify how much information was out there about fish. For marine fisheries, we found data from about 45 countries and from freshwater species data from about 28 countries. Together, this covered about over 500 different species of fish. 
they were gaps. They were clear data gaps in terms of geography. Um, they were places where data was missing. Unsurprisingly, there were a lot of gaps across the tropics. And there were also gaps in terms of species. So 400 is only uh, a, a quarter of what's reported in the FAO catch statistics. But we wanted to plug the gaps. We wanted to see whether we can use the information that we do have to plug gaps and develop information um, for the species that are commonly consumed around the world, but for which we don't actually know how nutritious they are. So we drew on ecological theory um, and gathered a range of information. In this case, we gathered it from Fishbase, um, which is a open access database that's been around for 30 years and is accessed by fishery scientists and managers all around the world. Um, I think they report they have over or up to 900,000 visits um, a month, every month. So we drew on ecological theory and we asked the question, well, if we want to develop a model to plug the gaps, what types of things do we expect to influence the nutrients in the fish that we're eating? And we identified four broad categories. So phylogeny, so the family that fishes belong to essentially, the diet, what a fish is eating, the thermal regime, so the temperature within which it's found, and the energetic demand, how quickly it grows, how big it is, how much it reproduces, how fast it moves. And we thought all of these things were likely to affect the nutrients in fish. And we developed a series of Bayesian models um, to predict the nutrient content based on these characteristics that all can be found in fish base. And what we found, I'm gonna just highlight a few aspects from this graph here. So we found that species that lived in a tropical thermal regime, so species from the tropics, but also species that tended to be smaller, had far higher concentrations of calcium, iron, and zinc. We also found that species that fed, had a pelagic feeding pathway, and that were found in polar thermal regimes, so lived in colder areas, tended to have higher concentration of omega-3s. And although we could also predict the protein content in the different species of fish, the practical significance was, was, was much less. By that I mean, although the calcium, iron and zinc concentrations differed significantly for across species, when it came to protein, there was a relatively small range. So when it comes to protein, we can say a fish is a fish, but when it comes to the other micronutrients, we really need to develop a better understanding of what levels are found in which um, different species. So this model is now, we've managed to integrate this model into fish base. Um, so anyone anywhere in the world can download nutrient values for all of the species that are found in their waters um, and upload new raw empirical data to improve these models. We've used this model to answer a number of questions. So firstly, what we were able to do is apply this model to what we know about what's caught in different waters around the world. So the FAO and a project called the Sea Around Us Project at the University of British Columbia um, have been collecting fish catch data um, based on what is available in the water and what different vessels are pulling out of the water in different countries EEZs, so they're economic exclusive zones. So we applied our model to the FAO and the UBC fish catch data to develop maps of how much nutrients are currently being pulled out of different waters. I'm just going to show you a couple. So this is the nutrient concentration map for calcium. So how calcium rich are the catches that are being pulled out of waters around different countries economic exclusive zones. There's two things I'd like you to take note from this graph. So firstly, we're looking at what's being fished out of the waters. Um, we're not talking about who's fishing it. So when it comes to fishing um, in, in around the world, um, countries um, set up fishing licenses with each other. And so countries are able to fish in other countries' waters perfectly legally, 
There's also, of course, um, illegal fishing that already that also happens. But this data is just saying what is caught in the EEZs of different countries around the world. And what we find is that there are really high concentrations of calcium in certain geographies, um, such as the Caribbean, where we already know that calcium deficiency risks or, or, or the, 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 the calcium in local diets is, is, is at a relatively high um, level of inadequate intake. So we can apply these concentrations to the total yield and calculate to the total catch yield and calculate how much calcium is being pulled out of waters around the world. And if we compare this to the prevalence of inadequate intakes in the local diets bordering those economic exclusive zones, we get a bit of a picture about what's happening to the nutrients available in fisheries. What we found, so the black line that you can see um, just below a thousand um, milligrams per person per day. In this instance, it's per five-year-old um, person in a hundred kilometer band of the coastline. So any point above the black line suggests that what's being currently pulled out of that country's water is in excess of what's needed to meet the dietary needs of um, a child under five. Each dot refers to a different country. And if you look along the bottom axis, it tells you, well, based on what's currently available in the markets in those countries, how much, how inadequate is the available supply of calcium in the markets? So for some places, for example, Kiribati, where calcium deficiency is, well, the, the inadequate calcium intake is 82%. The catches are far in excess of what would be needed to meet um, the dietary needs of under five population in Kiribati. And in fact, it would only, re it would only require approximately 1% of the catches um, that are currently being fished out of Kiribati to close those dietary gaps. Just to quickly look at iron, a similar picture emerges. You can see in the map on the left-hand side that the areas of really high calcium uh, iron concentrations are across the tropics. And if we move across to the right-hand side, and you've got the, again, you're gonna have the iron yield coming up the y-axis and along the bottom, how inadequate are the local diets in terms of iron. And again, we've got a large number of countries that despite having very high prevalence of inadequate iron intake, they still have yields far in excess of that that would be needed to close these nutrient gaps. So in Namibia, for example, uh, the inadequate intake of iron based on local, what's available in local markets is approximately 47%, but it would only take 5% of what's currently caught in Namibia's waters to close those nutrient gaps. And in fact, for 22 countries, it would only take for 22 countries where inadequate intake is over 20%, it would only take 20% of their catches to close those gaps. So there are opportunities for interventions. What's available locally is not getting to local diets. So there should be opportunities for us to close these gaps without requiring um, considerable um, interventions or redistributions. But a lot of fish and a lot of seafood is traded. As I said at the beginning, seafood is the number one most traded seafood commodity. Um, and we also know that even more fish is moved through foreign fishing. So approximately one and a half times the amount of fish that's moved through trade, international trade, is moved internationally through foreign fishing. So there really should be opportunities for international regulations that are concerned with the movement of fish to protect the right to food. So if we, instead of looking what's caught in different countries' waters, take a look at what countries are gaining. So what are countries producing? Where are, what, where are the catches and the products, the productions from aquaculture going? Unsurprisingly, if we take into, unsurprisingly, the amount of fish that it's produced per worker is highest in places such as, such as Norway. Um, and if we calculate the Gini coefficient, which we did in this study, we found that they're, they're incredibly unequally distributed. 
And we see a very similar picture if we look at the distribution. So here, if we look at the production or the amount, the value of resource that's being exported, the, the resource gained through exports from a country. And if we look at the consumption, so how much people in the country have available to eat. So all of these three dimensions of the aquatic food system are very unevenly distributed. Some of these distributions are due to differences um, in resource endowments. Some of them are due to differences in economic um, development trajectories. But what we were interested in understanding is to what extent are these distributions the result of aspects of social difference? So what it, to what extent do things like education, wealth, gender equality, linguistic diversity, cultural hegemony, or age dependency determine as the amount that countries benefit from the production, the distribution, and consumption of fish food systems. So in production, we look at the production per worker, so how much are countries getting in terms of fish or seafood. We also look at the number of people that are employed in that industry and how dense in terms of nutrients what's being produced is. In terms of distribution, we looked at exports, so the revenues gained, but we also looked at how affordable the seafood were in those countries. And when we came to consumption, we looked at the total amount of seafood that people were consuming, but we also looked at reliance. So how important what they're consuming is to their diets in terms of what proportion of animal protein. So you could have a country that's consuming a large quantity of seafood, but because they have many other animal source food options that they also consume in large quantities, they're less reliant on the seafood. So they wouldn't, in dietary terms, they wouldn't be impacted by a loss in the seafood. Importantly, it's important to note that the production may be coming from um, their own domestic waters, but they may also be coming from other countries' waters through these licensing agreements um, that, that I mentioned earlier. What we found was that countries um, with higher levels of education tended to produce more, whereas countries with lower levels of occasion, education supported more livelihoods and they were more reliant on the aquatic foods. We found where gender equality was greater, seafood also tended to be more affordable. And where linguistic diversity was greater, more livelihoods were supported, the foods tended to be more nutrient dense, but they were able to export less. So together this suggested that there are these two different groups of benefits or gains that countries get from these fish food systems. So they're these wealth generating benefits. So the production, countries that produced more also exported more and they also consumed more. And these countries tended to be wealthier and they tended to have more formal education. And then there are other places where there were more wealth, welfare sustaining benefits. So these are places where um, more livelihoods were supported in these aquatic foods. The foods tended to be more nutrient dense they also tended to be more affordable and people were more reliant on them. And these places tended to be more culturally diverse and gender equality tended to be greater. So this highlights that international regulation is necessary, concerned with the movement of fish and that regulation should protect the right to food but also that it's important for this international regulation to avoid the concentration of these wealth generating benefits that also exacerbate climate change. So there are various things that um, um, these, so there are various things that uh, international agreements can do to try and support um, the, um, sorry, to protect um, the right to food um, in terms of uh, limiting the flow of um, fish through international trade, but also through foreign fishing. 
but there may also be things that national policies and practices can do in order to protect the welfare sustaining benefits of these places. So we turned um, to the policies, national level policies um, in 173 countries. And we focused on policies that looked at the production. So policies concerned with fisheries, policies concerned with aquaculture production. And we analyzed the content of those policies. We also turned to policies that were concerned with the consumption of foods. So these were policies um, such as um, food security policies or nutrition policies. Um, and we looked to these policies to try and see, well, to what extent do these policies, are, to what extent are they able to protect welfare sustaining benefits? And to what extent do they recognize these aspects of social difference that predict or that are associated with the, these unequal distributions of benefits? When we looked at the national policies, we found that in general, they were pretty good at recognizing wealth. So in particular, in South Africa, policies tended to make a lot of reference to the challenges associated with lower income communities um, and supported initiatives to, to support lower uh, income producers um, and workers to enter those industries. They also tended to be good at recognizing age. Um, so in particularly um, policies from Western Asia um, and Southern Asia um, um, gave paid attention to different ages. But when it came to gender, and in particular, when it came to gender, these policies, there were a large number of policies that made no reference to gender. Um, and in fact, it was over 50% of the policies concerned with the production of fish, so the act of fishing and, um, and, and then the trade and sale of fishing made no reference to gender at all. This is despite 50% of those engaged in fish food systems um, being female. So there is an opportunity for policies, for national policies to be more gender sensitive and more gender sensitive policies should be able to support more affordable nutrient dense foods. So the final thing we did in terms of looking at the policies and practices was we pulled out a number of countries that based on the affordability of fish and the consumption of fish in the, those countries, um, identified them as either bright spots or dark spots. So the bright spots were places where fish tended to be more affordable and consumption tended to be higher, despite there being lower measures of wealth and lower levels of gender equality. So something was happening to, to, to support these welfare sustaining benefits in these countries, despite aspects of social difference in those countries, um, we would, despite the fact that we would have expected the characteristics of those countries to be working in the opposite direction. We also, pulled out what we called dark spots as a comparison. And these are places where fish was far less affordable and consumption was far lower, despite countries not having particularly low levels of metal, wealth and gender equality. And at least not levels enough to explain um, 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 these differences. And we read the policies of these bright and dark spots in, in, in detail to try and understand the context within which these policies were thinking about aspects of social difference, that were thinking about gender, thinking about wealth, about education. And what we found was that in the bright spot countries, so these places where seafood was more affordable and consumption was higher, the policies did a really good job of recognizing social difference. So class, gender, um, ethnicity was recognized. And the policies had these very clear declarations of justice or equity or human rights, and they elevated these as guiding principles. In contrast, where we had these policies from countries that we called these dark spot countries, although where policies did recognize social difference, many of them didn't, where they did recognize social difference, the language tended to place the burden 
on the marginalized. So it was women's responsibility to, um, to, to, to lift them out of poverty. Um, it was women who were called on uh, to uh, take on new livelihoods, for example. When it came to the redistribution of, 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 of resources or access, the bright spot countries made very clear cases for these justice claims. So if they were redistributing resources, it was very clear why those resources were being redistributed. And these were linked to structural drivers of injustice. So recognized um, barriers that certain social groups faced that would lead them to be in a disadvantaged positions and the redistributions were addressing those, uh, uh, those, 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 those barriers. The policies also tended to be cross-sectoral. So the fisheries policy would mention the food and nutrition policies and intersectional. So uh, strategies to address gender inequality would also address um, wealth-based inequalities and strategies would engage men, but also women. Conversely, the dark spot countries tended to really reinforce stereotypes. Um, and social norms. So they had language in there that kind of were, were reminiscent of, of, of policies from the sort of 70s and 80s welfare policies, but that talked about the undeserving poor. Um, and finally, representation. So aspects of social difference and different categories of people in society um, represent their representation in political processes and decision-making processes was really important. And again, equity was elevated to a guiding principles. These clear processes for people to participate in decision-making were made, and there was a downward accountability. Again, in the dark spot countries, representation was unspecified or it really lacked this downward accountability. So this really highlights that yes, there are things that can be done at an international scale and need to be done, but there are also things that need to be happen that can be done at a national scale. So policies that recognize social difference would support more affordable nutrient dense foods. And in doing so, they'd be able to protect those welfare generating benefits. So just to summarize, um, the first thing I think is really important to underscore is fisheries currently are critical to food and nutrition security in terms of their global scale, but also in terms of where fisheries are most important, where they're producing most, where they're supporting most livelihoods, where they are plugging the most critical nutrient gaps in people's diets. And this is particularly in parts of Asia and in Africa. But global action on climate is critical to guaranteeing this and guaranteeing it into the future. There are places and options for national and international policies um, to be you know, developed, more progressive, more contemporary policies that support the right to food. At an international scale, there is a need for regulations that, protect, that can protect the right to food in agreements over the movement of fish. So wherever movement of fish is being discussed or negotiated, which is often in these very, um, these processes that lack transparency, a right to food really needs to be at the core of those discussions and considerations and elevated uh, uh, to, to a higher level of consideration. There's also a need for policies to avoid the concentration of the wealth generating benefits. These are benefits that also exacerbate climate change. So countries that produce more, being able to export more, being able to consume more, and all of those productive processes feed into the climate change that's hitting hardest in the parts of the world where people are least able to, to even access the fish that are being fished off their coastlines. And finally, there is a place also for national policies that recognize gender and social difference, that link redistributive policy practices to the structural drivers of injustice. So really making those change and to centering principles of equity and human rights and providing really clear processes for participation to ensure people have a political voice in these uh, 
in, 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 in within these four. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to, I guess, acknowledge a number of different people who've contributed again. Um, and thank you very much, um, Karina and everyone for, for, for having here, me here to speak today. And I would be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Christina, for that fascinating uh, talk and for presenting so clearly the results of your own work as well as those as, as colleagues, uh, really uh, fascinating. Uh, feel free to, to stop sharing your, your screen now um, and, um, and we'll go to some questions. Um, I'm actually gonna indulge myself by asking a first one because it's about, it's to clarify, and I, sorry if I may have missed something here, but there was two things I, uh, it would be useful to clarify, and again, you may have explained this and I just missed it, but um, on the wealth generating, I found this, this difference between this wealth generating and welfare sustaining absolutely fascinating and uh, what a rigorous piece of work, but nevertheless being able to come up with those categories. But um, you said that the wealth generating countries also consumed more, but that the welfare sustaining, um, they were cheaper and more uh, supporting of welfare so I just couldn't quite work out whether in fact people do eat a lot of fish in the welfare sustaining um, and um, and they just also consume a lot in the wealth generating so just just a clarification on that and um, and then the other point of clarification was about the importance of protecting the right to food and the welfare um, sustaining um, that what, what is the most important thing that is undermining the right to food or the right to fish is, is something to, to consume and to, to generate a livelihood from? What is the most important thing that is undermining that right to food in those countries? Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, um, no, thank you. I mean, those are really yeah, important points. Um, so, so I guess um, there's some, some details about the model. So when you know, so when I say, so sorry, so, so firstly, consumption is higher in countries that are wealthier and lower in countries that are less, less wealthier. Um, but reliance, so, so in those wealth generating countries, consumption is, is higher, but in the wealth sustaining countries, welfare sustaining countries, um, reliance is higher. So even though the amount that's being eaten is more, the proportion that what's eaten, the proportion of animal source food is, is, is greater. Um, that makes sense. So basically, I guess, I guess, so there's a, so for example, I'm gonna fudge these numbers a little bit because I can't quite recall them off the top of my head. But for example, in Europe, we eat on average 20 kilograms of fish per person per year. And that will contribute something like 10% of the animal source food that in Europe we eat because we have lots of other animal source food that we eat. Um, whereas in Africa, the average amount of fish that's eaten is, 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 is 10 kilograms per person per year. So it's half, but that 10 kilograms is over 20% of the animal source food that's consumed in Africa. So even though they're eating more, even even though they're eating a lot less in Africa, it's much more important to their diets. So the contribution to diets is in the welfare sustaining places, but the consumption, just the straight um, increase in consumption, is in the wealth generating places because of lots of alternatives. Yeah, that's it. So, and and there's a little, I guess, there's a little bit about the model because the model. It's not separating countries directly to welfare, what welfare. It's saying to what extent does wealth and education drive these things? But we do know that we can probably categorize countries based on wealth and education and those variables. Um, and then the second question around what's the most important um, barrier, I think, or challenge to a right to food. When, so when it comes to food systems or to fish food systems, I, I would say it's it's just it's how um, so fish is quite a valuable commodity. So it 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 can be you know you can sell the same fish in Europe and get a lot more money 
than in, in Africa. So I've just recently come back from Senegal actually and trying to dig into these issues a little bit there. And um, one of the things that's really unfolding there and becoming quite a challenge is in Senegal. Senegal, um, fish consumption is really important. So it's a big part of people's diets. Um, and the cheapest form of fish in Senegal is these small sardines. And they're really nutritious, but they're really bony. So they're not very expensive, but that means everyone can access them. So and all the poor eat fish and it's a really important staple food rich in these micronutrients. Um, and sardine wasn't very, you know, it wasn't, didn't attract a very high price on the global market, but increasingly it is because sardine is a really valuable product that gets turned into fish meal and fish oil. So suddenly something that wasn't very um, economically valuable, even if it was valuable for people's diets, is now economically valuable. So it makes more economic sense to sell the sardines to be ground up into fish meal, to be, to be sold to rear livestock in Europe or Asia, or to feed pets or to feed um, um, other forms of farmed fish. So I think that's why, so it is the kind of, you know, it is the, the economic arguments to export fish are greater than the economic arguments to retain fish locally. I see, it's fascinating. I, I, I have to say, I, I eat quite a lot of sardines. Uh, as someone um, I, who is uh, influenced by health messaging on omega-3s, I'm a big fan of eating uh, sardines, which are cost like um, 40 pence. Uh, I often have them for lunch. I'm going to go right downstairs after this meeting, <laughs> check where they're from and, and, and look into them much more closely, because I always just assumed they were, it was totally harmless and, and uh, uh, there wasn't an issue here, but it's interesting to hear about uh, most of them going to fish meal, which of course, one yeah, it's not doesn't sa sound like exactly the best uh, um, the best use of them. Fascinating. Thank you so much uh, for for answering those questions so clearly with such great examples. We got some really interesting questions coming in now. Uh, Timothy Fitzgerald says, "Excellent presentation. Uh, thanks for comparing your data set." Have you come across examples of countries that have successfully reduced their aquatic food exports or foreign access agreements in order to maximize domestic livelihood opportunities or nutrient distribution to vulnerable populations? It's a great question. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And um, I guess I'll go back to Senegal for my example, just because I've, I've been there recently and I guess it's it's on my mind. and and and. I think the sad thing is Senegal's doing everything wrong. Right, sorry, right. <laughs> They're doing everything right. Um, they have um, got rid of all their international agreements. So the only international agreement that Senegal has for foreign fishing licenses is with the EU. And that's only for a limited number of species. So it's for tuna, and I think it's for black bass. Um, previously, you know, there were, there were Russian vessels, there were Russian agreements, there were agreements with Chinese, there were agreements with all sorts of different countries. So they've got rid of that, they've done the right thing. But unfortunately, what that has done is instead of stopping foreign fishing, it's essentially driven it underground. So it's driven it to, it's, it's less transparent than it ever was. Um, so it's not a fish, it's not, you don't now have foreign fishing in the official records. Um, what you have is these essentially front companies. So you know, in Senegal, you, you now to have an industrial fishing license, you have to be Senegalese. So you will have these front companies that Senegalese owned, but all of the money and is, is, is foreign and all of the fish then goes elsewhere. So, so it is actually really difficult to get around it because it's really difficult to know what the best policies are to do because even when countries are doing the right thing, the incentives to get around that are, 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 are considerable um, and we don't yet have the systems to monitor, to improve the transparency and traceability. Um, and we also don't yet have the international, you know, agreement that this is what we should be doing. So, so yeah, so yes, there are countries, but then unfortunately it creates other, other challenges. 
Ooh, th there is another example actually that I'm not so familiar with, but I know um, in the Pacific, they've actually, countries there have come together and formed um, agreements that involve all of the countries in the Pacific. And, and I think those agreements that include blocks of countries protecting their regional waters um, tend to be more, more, more successful. So I think as a model for West Africa, that's probably a good way forward. Well, there's a lot of interest in our uh, amongst our audience tonight in this issue about about trade agreements and starting with a question from Peter uh, saying there's a growing evidence that we need smaller, shorter and slower global trade to make zero carbon in line with 1.5 possible. And there's growing recognition of the role of trade agreements in enforcing climate agreements. How does this fit in with changes to trade policy relating to fish as a food source and what are the trade policy interventions that support the right to food when it comes to fish and the movement of fish? You just said it's really difficult because it's they can be undermined, but I think you were referring to a national policy and you said there isn't the international agreements in place. But uh, So what are your comments on, on that? And does this fit in with other changes to trade policy to tackle climate change? Yeah, I think I think it, absolutely it does. I think it's um, I think the examples and the points that you made there I can't quite remember them off the top of my head but where you were hitting in, in my mind absolutely the right the right points um we do need to move away from you know these trade agreements being behind closed doors and there needs to be some level of transparency I think it's critical that climate is considered in all of those so so we have to move away from these agreements that make economic sense that make absolutely zero that make economic sense on some levels not on all i think that make wealth generating economic sense but not necessarily wealth sustaining economic sense and i think that's relevant in the uk as well um so yeah i think if, if, if issues of climate have to be at climate and i think a right to food have, have to be these kind of guiding principles that supersede all of our our trade agreements and and fish um considerations of fish, I think, are just as important as the other trade deals that you're talking about, if not more so, I think, because we have so much less transparency currently, and so much more fish is moved than, than other forms of food. And Paulina asks, it's a similar question, do you believe, and to what extent, that food free trade commercial agreements and their associated subsidies uh, affect the opportunities available to small producers and women in particular? And you, I think you've made it clear that the economic imperatives um, encourage exports, um, but what about the actual specific agreements? And do they, and what kind of impact do they have on the small producers and women in particular? So, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I will answer that again with my example from Senegal because I am not a policy trade expert at all. So I'm st stepping outside of my com comfort zone, but I can talk to the empirics that I've observed in Senegal. Um, and again there, so these aren't agreements, but the effect of um, the increase in, in, in export of sardinella in the form of fish meal in Senegal is, is hitting the women the hardest. Um, and within fisheries, one of the issues that's been increasingly highlighted is how in terms of policy, but also research and funding, we have a very male, and a very production focus. So we think about what's being caught and we think about who's catching it. And we don't think about all of the other livelihoods that are supported along the value chain. And fisheries are quite segregated. So you do tend to have men going out to fish, not exclusively, and in geographies it varies. And then you do tend to have women who do a lot of the pre-processing -pre and the post-processing. So in Senegal, where we have now this, these new factories that have spun up, and you have this all along the West African coastline, the fishers are still able to sell their catch because actually they can sell the sardinella to the factories and they can get more money. Um, but the women have lost their jobs because their job was processing the sardinella and now the factory's doing that. So that was something that, you know, really was was an oversight because we have this, this gender blind per perspective of, of, of fisheries. Um, so I think that was a long winded way of saying, without getting into the detail of any of the agreements and policies, because of how blind we are to social difference, they inevitably will create 
inequities that are that are that are felt most by those who are more marginalized in the food system anyway. So in response, uh, Onella has a question here about taking into account the food sovereignty. Uh, what do you think could be a balance between international trade and sovereignty and the right to food? I, um, I think you've kind of already answered that question in, in saying that you think the balance needs to move against um, international trade, which is driven solely by an economic imperative. Yeah, I, 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 I think so. And I think the other thing that I would then add to that, um, and maybe this didn't fully come out, but the focus of the kind of policy analysis that we did was was looking at representation and recognition in policies. So countries that do ensure that you know, everyone is represented in policies and has a political voice. So there are these processes that ensure that everyone engaged along the food system has access to those decision-making processes and there is downward accountability. I think that, I th yeah, I think that, that, I think it all starts with recognition and representation. So ensuring producers, consumers, um, uh, processes all have that, that political voice. And um, which some, there were some great examples of policies that re really do have this. Um, I think Liberia really stood out as a really good example. Um, um, and yeah, so yeah, so I think it is that. And I, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> the other thing I'd say is that I don't think, I'm not, anti-trade at all. I think trade is a really important and valuable part of, 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 of economies and needed. It's just trade with a more greater balance of power across everyone involved. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, trade with a human face. Um, uh, Jessica picks up on your Senegal example and, and she asks, she says, if a country better assess their spending on national health and child feeding programs, they might realise the cost of exporting fish rather than keeping it locally. Uh, so she's speculating about perhaps why uh, countries don't follow this rather obvious logic. <laughs> yeah, I think that is true. But I would say that Senegal does have an excellent nutrition programme. They, 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 the health system in, in Senegal, given its you know, economic situation, I, I think is fantastic. So we went, you know, we, but they, they have, I mean, Senegal's on the edge of the Sahel, on the edge of the Sahara. It experiences, you know, in, incredible pressures on its food system. So malnutrition is, a, severe malnutrition is a part of life, particularly as you move into the Sahel. And you know that's that's the same across the whole Sahel band. So I guess yeah, so I do agree. I think if you if countries, uh, yeah. So yes, yes, I do agree with you. But my caveat is I do think there's a very good system set up in Senegal. Um, the global economic pressures still I think are are are, are difficult. And so Senegal has his their plan, de, de, their you know their emergence plan. And so on the one hand, they're trying to stimulate economic growth whilst addressing, you know, social issues that they have in the country. So, so it is a real, you know, it's a real, I'm not a politician, <laughs> so I'm glad I'm no, not. I, I mean, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult example of a trade-off and that um, we can't make assumptions that just because a national government has power that they're all powerful, that there's always so many different things that people uh, feel pulled in, in different directions by all the time. It's a really, it's a, it really is a, a, a classic kind of difficult trade-off. I can, I can see that. Now, moving, uh, uh, switching gears slightly to the UK. Uh, we've got a couple of questions about, about the UK. And the first one is from Katie. Uh, she says she'd love to, who's from Wales, uh, who, who works in Wales. Uh, we'd love to see where Wales fits into this system. And she makes the observation which is the same in, in uh, uh, England as well, uh, where in Wales, the coastal communities have the highest child poverty rates. And there was, uh, before Brexit, around 1,200 full-time and part-time fishermen and women in Wales. But very little seafood caught and landed in Wales is eaten in Wales. Uh, so I think she's asking, uh, making a comment um, but it, it'd be fascinating to know whether, given your work, your global and more international work, whether this 
resonates at all. Yeah, no, I think it does. I mean, you know, I know I know the UK context more because it's interesting and um, I live here rather than I, I know people who, who work in the UK context. And, you know, the this analysis that I presented is at this national level. And if you, you know, if you dig down into every country, you know, you're going to find, I think, parallels. And I think, yeah, I mean, in Britain is our... Yeah, I, I, I live here in Lancaster, Morecambe's, you know, just two miles away from me and we don't even have a fishmonger in the whole of the city of Lancaster anymore. The last the last one closed down um, just before COVID. And yeah, it's, we have this incredible wealth of nutritious food just on our doorsteps and as I think coastal communities in the UK as well as in, in England is, is I think are similar to Wales. Um, so these, you know, the inequities in the food system are definitely not just international. We find them within, within all the, within, within all our, within our wealthiest countries as well. And yeah, yeah. So I think it, it does resonate definitely what you said about Wales. And a lot of that is, sorry, it, you know, it's the, you know, the old fishing communities in the UK are are the, the some, often the least deprived communities and because those industries have kind of been forgotten. In yeah, no, it's, I mean, it makes, sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> sharing affections, but it, it's, it's, it's something that's, uh, I, when I was growing up, I grew up in the northeast of England in, in York, and, um, and we used to go um, to um, a place near Whitby uh, to, to, to go to the seaside when I was a child, and we used to go and get kippers, um, uh, smoked, um, smoked heavens what what is the original fish to kippers i can't even remember now um but anyway we used to get smoked uh from willy fortune's uh kippers and it was and it was always such an amazing treat to do that but it was part and parcel i mean in york we had um at the local market we had lots of fish stalls i i i doubt it's the same now uh, so there, there has been and my husband's from liverpool and tells me of the stories of the fish in, in liverpool uh, that people such as himself from a working class background used to buy regularly and it was just normal um, to buy the cheap, uh, the, the cheapest fish and it's, it's all uh, changed so it really has been a, a sector that's changed enormously and Lindy's got a question and she says she can't resist but asking what your advice would be uh, to UK uh, uh, fishers especially um, in Scotland actually where in light of both climate change and Brexit uh, this is a rather difficult question to answer, but uh, can the UK have sustainable fisheries? Like, what's what's to be done in the in this UK context? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, so in the UK, I think it's something like seventy six percent of fishers in the UK are small scale fishers. So, and small scale fishers have a far lesser impact on the environment than industrial fishers, um, and you know, whilst I didn't vote for Brexit, there is potentially an opportunity for the UK to have a much, you know, greener um, fisheries policy and look after the jobs in the fishing industry, renovate, you know, revitalize, uh, you know, there's a real culture along with, that goes with fishing, that goes with fishing communities that, you know, I think the kippers and the recipes and all of that, so there is an opportunity, I think. I'm just not sure we'll take it. Yeah. Okay, there's some, a few more questions here. And one from uh, Jessica, which is actually about this bright spot and dark spot countries, which I also found fascinating. Uh, she says, have you mapped these countries? And if so, um, is um, will the map be in the public domain? Um, um, so I'm trying to remember. <laughs> Um, so it won't be yet. It's, it, the paper's currently in review, um, but we haven't. No, we haven't mapped the bright spots and dark spot countries, but we do have them in the table in in, in the appendix, so, so you can definitely see them. Um, and you know, the, so it was based on so the initial model that, like I showed, that looked at how education, wealth, um, gender equality, how they were associated with elements of, of production and consumption and exports. It was that model that was then used to say, well, so if this is what, based on the global model, this is what we're seeing, um, are there places that are that are behaving differently? 
are there countries that actually are, are look, look like they're doing better than you would expect them to and doing worse than you'd expect it to. So it's it really, it, it, I mean, it, the idea is drawn on the kind of the old you know, Vietnamese and um, was it UNICEF that did the original um, bright spots analysis to do with the rice, um, I don't remember. But yes, sorry. So the quick answer is definitely the countries will be in the in the in the appendix. Um, but there are there are also lots of global maps to how the, the, the food system dimensions are, are distributed. Great, thank you. And there's another question here from Sabine about um, also about countries. Um, uh, and she um, mentions uh, for fish, uh, for, uh, for whom fish is of heritage food. So I'll, I'll read out the question. You've understandably focused on the transnational movement of fish through trade, though it started me wondering about nutrition and access to fish for those in major consuming nations for whom fish would be a heritage food, uh, such as the Pacific Coast First Nations in Canada and fishing treaties. Have you found your models work in such context of potentially unequal access within a single country, especially ones ostensibly held to be wealth generating? Um, or is this something that you'll be studying in the future? Yeah, so I mean, that's a really important question and, and it gets at the, the, I think the limitations of these kind of global national level um, um, analyses. And so we look, yeah, so we looked at a national level but um, Zach Cohen, who's one of my lead authors as well, he's now delving down into some of the subnational data to look at how things play out differently um, if, you, if you get down into the details. And there's some really interesting, I mean, I don't work in Canada, but I have lots of colleagues who work on food and food security in Canada. And I think there's, I think it is fascinating. And I think there's some really interesting and um, positive um, models coming out of there of how First Nations, how the government and the First Nations are beginning to work together to develop agreements. I don't know, I don't know, understand it very well, but it, it, it could be a really interesting model for how, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it, it, it's based on massive inequalities, but I think there might be a model for moving forward that's coming out of there. But, yeah, no, thank you. And it's certainly a, a food which is consumed uh, unequally. Uh, when you think about the fresh fish that people buy that costs quite a bit of money in this country and then the fish which is used in, in freezer foods and, and fish fingers and, and so on, it's just quite a different um, price point and consumed by quite different demographics. Uh, so I, I think it is, there's different types of inequality, I think, there too. Lindy also asks um, about the standards for big fisheries, such as the Marine Stewardship, uh, Stewardship Council. Um, are these helpful, do you think, to producers in low-income countries? Oh, um, hmm. per personally, I think standards, I do think they're good. I do think they should be used for particularly, you know, if you're going to the supermarket here and you don't know what to eat, I think it's good to take a look at them. I think what tends to happen is the fisheries that sign up to the Marine Stewardship Council are fisheries that are already sustainable. Um, so um, fisheries that are doing that are not gonna sign up to them because they're not gonna get it. Um, the other critique that I've heard of them is that they potentially are taking resources away from um, gov governments. So, so fisheries, they in the Pacific or somewhere else in an effort to get an MSC certification um, there are lots of loops that they have to jump through. So it's, 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 it's expensive and there's lots of things that they need to do. Um, and those are resources that could potentially be actually directed towards the governments to support government fisheries management. So I think I'm lukewarm about um, certification schemes. I, I, I wouldn't outright critique them, but I wouldn't turn to them as like the, the 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 solution i think it's they're part of the toolbox and i think they need to be used um particularly kind of as we transition i think you know out towards a more sustainable place great well thanks for those reflections so we've uh, uh, come to the end of our uh, uh, questions uh, if any uh, unless anyone would like to pose uh, a final uh, question there was certainly a very uh, rich set of questions that that came in 
and um it's uh yeah it was absolutely fascinating to hear your answers and certainly uh, uh, reflecting uh, a lot to reflect on uh, just uh, quickly peter just asks um does that uh, should standards uh, marine stewardship council and related standards be mandatory in government trade agreements given what you've said um, I, I don't think so because i think they actually disadvantage smaller um fisheries and smaller producers so i think it, it would lead to probably more concentration of fishing in you know the, the bigger companies so i, I wouldn't I, I don't think so yeah, I mean, it, it just strikes me that fisheries policy is, is the is such a complex area, and it's like even when you're trying to do a good thing, it has unintended consequences, and and all of these things need to be thought through. Which is this kind of looking at the different connections between things is something that we try and do very much at the Centre for Food Policy to understand these different implications, and certainly um, fisheries is an area that we need to look at more um, uh, more closely for for sure. So thanks very much for sharing with us um, these uh, valuable insights and perspectives and studies and evidence um, and leaving us all with so much to think about when it comes to the fish sector, uh, whether it be um, in, in countries all over the world or countries more close to home. Uh, there are clearly issues that we need to think about as, as eaters of fish for those who eat fish and um, as those of us who care about international development and climate change and supporting livelihoods and rights all of these issues come in and so thank you for laying that all out so clearly so thanks very much and, and the best of luck with your work going forward into the future and we look forward to hearing more from you so uh, thanks very much and thanks very much to the participants for asking such great questions thanks everyone